Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. We'll be right back to the show. But before we do, I want to tell you about today's sponsor, Factor Mills. Dot com, where if you go to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50, you can get 50% off your first order. That's factormills.com slash unbroken50. If you're like me and you are a person who is busy trying to create a life, heal, work on their health, wealth, and relationships, and not to mention deal with the day-to-days of normal life, you do not have time to be going to the grocery store and trying to figure out what you're going to cook every single day of the week. In fact, one time I did the math and I realized I was spending over 15 hours a week at the grocery store and cooking. When I added factor, I got to use that time for myself, for my family, for my friends, for my community, and for my business. And so if you're in the place where you need some more support in the kitchen, head to factormills.com slash unbroken50 and use the code unbroken50 to get 50% off. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show, but I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of live coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program. Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? Hope that you're doing well wherever you are in the world today. Very excited to be back with you with another episode with my great friend and guest, Jamie Green. Jamie, my friend, how are you today? What is happening Uh, in your world? I'm I'm excellent. How are you doing, Michael? I'm great. I'm very excited to hang out with you. So you and I have known each other for a couple of years now. 
We've almost got kicked off of planes together. We've gone to conferences together. We've ate dinner together. We've talked about family and life and kids and cars and all of those things. And so I'm super, super excited to have you on the show because two reasons. One, I love your story and your journey. And as people hear it today, I think that they are going to be mind blown. Um, and two, I think you're just one of the most genuinely just kind and awesome people that I've probably ever met. So I'm super excited to get to share you with the audience today. Um, for those who don't know you, why don't we start and tell us a little bit about your background, your childhood, and, and what it was like for you growing up? Oh, that's a, yeah, sure. Well, thank you for all the um, kind things you had to say about me. Uh, yeah, so I was adopted from Korea when I was five months old. So uh, came to America, flew on a Northwest Airline, I think it was Northwest Orient or something into Chicago O'Hare, my dad came and picked me up and they got like maybe three days notice that I was coming. So crazy story, the whole story, the backstory of all that. Um, came to America with a bag and a bottle and a blanket and, and some diapers. And that was like it. Um, grew up, my, I have an older brother and then two younger siblings. My sister is half black, half Korean. I'm from Korea. And then I have a younger brother that was adopted from India. And he, my sister was a year and a half when she was adopted. And then my, my little brother was adopted when he was two and a half. So we had this very diverse family in a very white neighborhood in Washington state. We stuck out like a sore thumb, whether we liked Good. it or not. You know, we, ha we were at that community where there were maybe like three or four black families that we knew maybe two or you know two or three hispanic families and like four asian families and they were like japanese korean and chinese like it we just we just stuck out we were different that was for sure uh so we grew up in this family um mom dad everything seemed normal you know it didn't we didn't know anything different uh, we had sibling rivalries, all that stuff um, growing up. And then I, I, I remember thinking, I'm so grateful to be adopted. I'm so grateful I got, you know, chosen to be a part of this family. And I, it's not obviously a perfect family, but it was a it was a family and all was well. And then when I was 12 years old, I learned that my uh, dad had had an affair. I actually overheard him talking to his mom about it. And as a 12 year old, you're thinking, like, what did I just hear? You don't really quite understand it, um, but you know it's not right. You just kind of know it's not right. Um, and I, on the way home, my mom had, so what was going on? My, my grandma lived in Eastern Washington and it was like a five hour drive from where we lived. So every summer we would go to see grandma and my mom would just have a weekend to herself just to, you know, as a mom with four kids, you kind of need that time to yourself. And I know as a mother of three, you just need a little bit of just alone time to relax and uh, just not worry about raising children at that moment in time. So she was uh, back home and the kid, my, my brother and my sister and my older brother, we all went uh, to visit my grandma for the 4th of July, Lake Chelan, Washington, um, if you're familiar with that area. But there was a big 4th of July boat parade and like parade and fireworks. And we were on this boat and I heard my dad talking to my grandma about it. So I just couldn't believe it. Like, I was like, what? My first thought was, is my dad gay? Because I just didn't think that he would be having an affair. I just didn't, that, that was my first thought um, for some reason. I don't even know why. But I had 12 that. And it I was compute. 12. Yeah, I was like, and I knew that like, well, anyways, I knew that my dad, he was a good looking, he's a good looking guy. And I knew that, you know, he would tell me like people, people will, guys and gals would always be hitting on him. So I thought, well, maybe he was gay or maybe he, I just, but he's not. <laughs> so he had an affair with a woman. And I remember hearing my grandma say to my dad, oh, I'm looking forward to meeting her. So then I was, I knew he wasn't gay at that point in time, but um, I 
had this information inside of me and I didn't know what to do with it. And it just created this turmoil inside of me. And we had a five hour drive going back home. And I used to do this thing. My dad had a, a Silverado, Chevy Silverado bench seat, you know, um, and it was automatic. And I would always sit next to him. And I loved my, I mean, I was really close with my dad. So this was why this part of the story with me and my dad, it was so like heartbreaking. Um, but one of the childhood memories is my dad would let me drive the truck with my left foot in my left hand. Or I'd like literally hold over on the steering wheel. He'd just sit back and let me drive on the freeway, like just sitting next to him. So we were doing that and um, like I was driving, we were driving back and I just, you know, I've always been one, if there's conflict or if there's something, I just try and address it head on. Like I need to know what's going on. I have to have an understanding of why, but I also knew the gravity of the story or what was unfolding in front of me. Like this could like destroy our family. And I had just had that thought of, oh my gosh, I'm so grateful for this family that I've been adopted into and, and everything. And then, so I asked the question. I asked my dad mm -hmm. on the drive home, my brother and sister, this was back before they had seatbelt laws and everything. They were sleeping in the back of the truck because we had a you mean, you mean when it was cool to be a kid? <laughs> yeah. And th th we had an air mattress and sleeping bags and I, you know, I had everything back there. And so it was just me and my dad in the truck cabin. And uh, and I asked him the question and he just kind of said, yes, but don't tell your mom. And I was mm. like, what? Like, how do you do that? It's a lot of pressure for a kid. It's, yeah. It's, it's wild because so often we, you know, a lot of kids experience that where they're like, don't tell your mom, don't tell your dad, don't tell your brother, you know, whatever it is. It's so so like a heavy fucking weight to carry at 12 years old. Definitely. So I got home and I just, everything changed. Like my perspective of everything changed. Um, you know, I didn't, I didn't say anything, but my sister said something and I was like, how did she know? Uh, but I think at the end of the day, my mom probably knew, Yeah. you know, uh, and they were just all kind of keeping things cool because they're probably trying to figure how, what do we do here? Um, but, and then eventually everyone, the family found out and, you know, my dad moved out and this and that. And so it just kind of disrupted our, this family that we had. Mm. I was so mad at my dad. I was angry. I didn't speak to him for three years. And if it was, it was nothing but profanities and how much like he destroyed our family, which really was, you know, I didn't like that that was what was inside of me. You know, I didn't like that I had all this anger and I wouldn't say hate, but just anger, like just like utter disappointment because I was super close with my dad. We'll be right back to today's show, but first I need to ask you a question. Are you feeling stuck? Are you feeling like you don't have the support to go to the next level in your healing journey? Are you feeling like you wish you had a little bit more support from not only myself, but the Unbroken Nation? Well, my friend, I want to invite you to come and join our live weekly coaching sessions in Think Unbroken. All you have to do is go to keys, K-E-Y-S, keys.thinkunbroken.com to sign up and join us today with 100% money back, no questions asked, guaranteed and no contract or commitment every week for the next year, you can come and be a part of our live coaching sessions each Monday as we dive deep into not only answering your questions, but questions from the unbroken nation and help you take all of the information that you learn in the podcast, in the courses and other areas of this journey, bring them into your life and use it in a way that is practical, life-changing and transformative. So my friend, join us at keys.thinkunbroken.com and we will see you this Monday. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I think um, that happens so often too, because like we're, we're looking at these people who we anticipate or we at least feel within us are, you know, supposed to take care of us and love us and support us and effectively be our superheroes. And, and I think part of the reason, at least, and this is my own thought process that we hold parents, especially to such a high regard is because of television and cartoons as a kid and movies where everybody loves their parents and everyone on this show knows my story. I certainly did not have that relationship. Obviously, yeah. you know, my story, but I, I do think a lot of it, like it comes from that place where you watch all of the, the space where people 
be a fuck up where people yep. make mistakes. And so immediately, I'm sure you must have been like dismantled, right? Yeah. Well, because, you know, I had friends who had divorced parents and I saw how they had to go one weekend here and one weekend there and summers here. And, and it just was like, it just didn't seem like normal or it just mm. didn't seem not normal. I don't want to say normal because there's nothing's normal in this day and age. Sure. Um, but it just it said, was unknown. It, yeah, it just is like what you just couldn't really plan your life. It was so bizarre just in that moment. But, you know, I one of the things uh, why I was adopted was because my birth parents were having an affair. And that's mm -hmm. why I was put up for adoption, because in Korea and in society, you just don't have children out of wedlock. Women, like, it's super shameful. So I knew that. So in knowing that about that's how I was conceived and that's why I was adopted and then seeing my adopted parents, that ones that are supposed to come in, you know, you kind of feel a little bit rescued, but not not in that rescued way. But you feel like, OK, I was chosen. I was adopted. They wanted me to be a part of their family. And then they wanted two more kids to be a part of their family. And then shortly thereafter, they make this catastrophic decision that splits up the family. So but then again, it's not unusual for families to to separate like that. So it wasn't like it was unusual, but for me, it just felt devastating. And so, um, you know, three years had passed. And in that three years, my mom met somebody and eloped to Vegas. We didn't know him very well. And that was just, again, like, I just what on earth? Like, what's going on with my parents? It's, it's crazy how, like, disconnected kids can be from that because one day, I swear to God, I will never forget this. I don't think I've ever even said this on the show before. I I was in my living room, and I'm like seven or eight. And this guy who I kind of had seen once or twice was like, hey, is it cool if I marry your mom? Here's what's <laughs> fucking crazy, Jamie. They got married that day. Like, and I mean, they had probably been dating for a minute, but, you know, now, yeah. obviously, looking back, he's a psycho, and I can see why enmeshment probably led to that and a whole bunch of other reasons, but we'll get into that at another time. But I, right. I remember just being like, why is nobody, like, talking about this and suddenly, yeah. like, we're okay with this? Yeah, it's the same thing. We met him a couple of times. We had those wired telephones, you know? Remember that? And there was a sneaky little thing. And my, if my mom was on the phone, I, I don't think I've ever told her this. But when she was on the phone for like more than an hour and it wasn't with a girlfriend or anything, I knew she was talking to somebody. And so I would go in the other, in the kitchen. She was in the bedroom. I'd go in the kitchen. I'd unplug it, pick up the phone, and then quietly put. I, I <laughs> like sneaky. kids these days will never know how to do that. But that's yeah, I know. And I was like, oh, she's talking to a guy. And who is this guy? And this, and so I knew something. And so was you're up. probably a teen now, right? Yeah, I was. Um, okay. I was 14 years old at this point okay. in time. So you're super mischievous. Oh, <laughs> but you know, all the whole time I was like, I always wanted to be responsible. I wanted, like, I just wanted to be in control of my life because, you know, things that are happening around you, you can't control. And so part of me just wanted to be the best student, the best, like, I just wanted to be a good person. Um, around that time, I started kind of, um, like going to this program called Young Life that they had at the school. So it was like a Christian-based organization. I went to that a few times. But my goal in life was to not hurt anyone, like, you know, to be a good citizen, to be a good friend, accept everybody because, you know, everything was clicky in junior high and middle school. And I just wanted to be that person that was a friend to, to, to anybody. Like I didn't care. I was athletic. I was... And, you know, I think I was like in the honor society and different things like that. But my goal in life was just to to do well and do the best I could with what I had. So when all these outside things were happening that were beyond my control, it, I felt, um, you know, it, when things happened that that impacted my life ex externally, I had to figure out how how to respond to that. And so when I learned 
that my mom had gotten married was we were driving. Um, I think she had picked me up from some after school sports thing. We were driving back to her apartment and I was like, um, no, she brought up, she's like, Hey, um, you know, we had just met Jim is his name. And I said, and he, she said, what would you say if I got married to Jim? And he was like, well, mom, you're the adult. Like that's a decision you have to make for yourself. And she's like, I didn't go. And if you did, I, I'd have to accept it. It's like, you know, what are you going to take advice from a, a teenager? You were arti- like, you articulated that as a kid. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I, impressive. yeah. So, um, so she's like, well, well, we got married two weeks ago in Vegas. I know. I don't know. <laughs> What's wrong with the doll? Like, what the fuck? I was like, oh, what? Like, well, then why are you asking me for permission? Like, it's done. Like, you're married. And you, like, know when you're, you know when you're a kid, you, like, maybe steal something. All right, maybe not steal something. But I stole a lot of shit as a kid. But maybe you do something that you know you're not supposed to do as a kid. And then you go ask for permission for it. Like, <laughs> that's what it sounds like is happening. It's yeah. like. Wait a second. What? Like, it's one of the things where, you know, so he came to visit and he he smoked at the time. And I had never smoked a cigarette in my life. I'd never drank an ounce of alcohol. I'd never said cuss words. Like, I'll never forget the first time I said the word fuck out loud. And I went, I was like, what's the big deal about this word? And so it was, in, it was probably right after I learned my mom got uh, married and that um, she announced we're going to move to California because that's where he lived and it was Santa Monica. And I just remember going, what is going on here? I remember walking to school and I was just so confused. I was mad. And I'm just like, I'm going to just say fuck. And I, go, and I just go, fuck, 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 fuck. And I was like, well, this isn't really making me feel better. So why? Yeah. I'm just not going to say the word. I get just remember, I just wanted to be good. My stuff is all. And in my mind, as a teenager, saying bad words was a good thing. Now I say them when, when I feel like I need to say them. Uh, but I, and I don't have any judgment over anyone who says any words. Like, I don't, if they can, you can say, you yeah. say fuck all the time. It's my call. I, I, I do. I literally, <laughs> I think I might. I'm so glad you just said that. I, I think I might hold the world record for the number of times fuck has been said on a podcast. Right. Was, was literally my first word. Like, literally. And wow. so that tells you about the environment that yeah. I grew up in. It's yeah. like everything you need to know. And I remember I was, I was sitting with my grandmother one day, and I was probably like, I don't know, 10 years old. And she was just in this rocking chair, chain smoking cigarettes, playing um, she used to have this digital card game and she just played all day long and we were watching a movie and I was just, for whatever reason, I was like, Hey, what was my first word? Do you know? And she's like, Oh, it was fuck. Just so nonchalant about it. And I was like, okay, that actually makes a lot of sense. So yeah, I get yeah. that. So now you're in this weird place, you know, got, I think we probably unforceably moved only once or twice as a kid. But we we probably lived with over 30, I lived with over like 30 different families as a kid, you know, getting bounced around place to place to place, dealing with the chaos of, of childhood and life. And that is so discombobulating. It's so dysregulating for kids. And, and it's really difficult when you're trying to, you and I are on a different spectrum, right? Because here I see, you know, you're thinking this way as a kid. I want to be good, be a good person, honor system you know, honor society, playing sports, all that stuff. Me, I'm like breaking the houses, stealing cars, running from the cops, you know, hooking up with girls. Like it's really just chaos, right? Yeah. What, when you moved, like what started to happen in your life? Yeah, it's a great question. It's so funny because my sister probably took the path that you took and I took the opposite path in responding to crisis in our lives. And um, so when we moved, the first thing that happened, um, you know, we sold the house that I grew up in. I reconciled with my dad because in my mind, I thought, well, I'm moving to California. I don't know when I'll see him again. And if something ever were to happen to him, I wouldn't want to hold a grudge with him. I would want him to know I forgave him. I I think I had come to meet the Lord. Like I I became a Christian. And it was one of those things where I was like, I don't want to live with unforgiveness and ir- ir- um, having unreconciled relationship with my dad. Like, 
I loved my dad and it pained me that for that long I had had, you know, held a grudge with him. But it was almost like my way of having power over the decision he made to like, I'm going to withhold myself from you because you made this decision to just like that disrupted and, and divided our family. Um, and, and then I was like, this is just that, that's silly. I'm not going to hold that over anymore. And then we moved to California. Before you go there, I have a question yeah. because when I was a kid and I think so many people deal with this, when they have moments of heartbreak as children, mm -hmm. we become resentful. We push back. We put up gigantic walls. Obviously you did for a period of time, but then to get to that point, place where you're like, I want to reconcile this. Like those kind of words did not exist in my vernacular as a kid. I was like, how the fuck do I burn this house down? Yeah. Right. And so <laughs> what I'm wondering is where did that come from for you? Is that innate? Is that a part of like the Jamie DNA? Because I'm sitting here like, I want to throw a brick through the window and you're like, I'm going to go and sit down and have a conversation. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I do think it was partly um, because I became a Christian at that moment, like in that junior high phase, like for as much as I knew what it meant to be a Christian, uh, you know, accepting um, the death of, of Jesus on the cross for my sins and my wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that I think is what really prompted inside of me that I can't hold unforgiveness towards him. Like if I am going to identify as a Christian and, and believe in that, I, I, for me, I couldn't, I couldn't hold unforgiveness towards him. Mm. I couldn't hold unforgiveness or any, any, um, anger or, or I never was really bitter towards my biological parents. I actually more or less felt it like what a gift, but also how hard, I mean, that's a whole nother story, a whole nother podcast of of all of that stuff, but it just was one of those things. Like I just, I don't know what made me do that, but I would say it was just my faith in God that I couldn't live. I couldn't call myself a Christian and then be like unforgiving towards my dad. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I, it took me a long time to get to forgiveness. I mean it, and even now I think about it in a magnitude of ways, one of which is it, in part, I think to some extent, and it's con contextual, obviously, I think there are some areas in forgiveness in which it must be earned and mm -hmm. not just allotted. And I think for me, that just, that comes in relationships and reconciliation and a lot of those things. Cause you know, it's one thing to be like, I forgive you. And then the same thing happens again. Yeah. That I played that game with my mom for you know my entire childhood. Yeah. And then there's the other forgiveness where it is, it is for you. Because it's like if you're carrying that backpack of bricks with you mm -hmm. everywhere you go, it weighs you down. Yeah, like, it does. It, and it's not just the forgiveness of other people, but like you, you have to forgive yourself too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because I, uh, name a mistake, name a terrible thing a human being can do outside of killing someone. I've probably done it, right? I've been able to go and stand and look in the mirror be okay with the reflection on the other side, love myself as is, and just say, you know what? Like I'm human having mm -hmm. a human experience. And guess what? I'm going to screw up again. Like it's only inevitable, right? It's like, it's coming. And so that's so astute of you to be that young and obviously having, you know, I, I think we fail to look at mentors we have in, in our childhood as, you know, even the kid who's a senior in high school, Right. Or even the, yeah. you know, the, the church leader or whatever it might be for you. And I imagine there just must have been some people who just spoke into you in a really powerful way. Absolutely. You know, and this is I, I played competitive fast pitch. So I had coaches. I had friends. My, my parents, we had good friends. They were all there and supportive and everything. So, I mean, it definitely wasn't just this like profound thing that happened in my life just out of thin air, but there were, there was a community of people that were there and supportive in a very, um, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for, but in, it, they didn't realize the impact that they were making on my life to make me re feel like I mattered. Like mm. that, if that makes sense. 
totally. Uh, or to keep going. And so, you know, my dad and I, we, we had those hard conversations and I was able to express the decisions that he had made and how, how it hurt me so deeply. And, and he apologized and he asked for forgiveness. So it wasn't like I just gave it to him, but there was um, an exchange of that. And of course I apologized for how disrespectful and, and I, mm-hmm. how I was with him. And so it was this moment of release and um it almost wants to bring me to tears right now but it was just one of those things where it's like it pained me to hold that against him if for any longer like I just didn't want to do that um and and so because I was moving to Cal from Washington to California with my mom and her new husband who we did not know we didn't know him very well my sister ended up staying with my dad. My brother and I moved down to California. My older brother was out of, you know, graduated and getting married and everything. So he's doing his own life. Um, but we moved to California and we didn't know anybody. And I was a fresh, I was considered a freshman. So I went from a junior high of like maybe 400 people into a Santa Monica High School with, I Holy think, 2,200 kids. Yeah. Culture shock, right? A uh, hundred, like a thousand. Yeah. <laughs> But that saving grace there, like it took me probably two weeks to bring myself to go to school. And my stepdad, he's my mom and my stepdad are still married to this day. But one of the weird things, and, and I just spent three weeks with them in New York, and we were kind of talking about this, how you know, it's incredible that they've made it. It's incredible the life that they've built um, through adversity because they definitely experience adversity in their relationship. Um, but what was so, but what was so strange was he was only 10 years older than me. Mm. So he was 25 when my mom got married to him and I was 15. So it was extremely bizarre. And he's Indian, but he grew up in England and his family, his parents were Indian. And like when I say Indian, they didn't speak much English. So here we are not only in a new state. This is a sitcom, by the way. I yeah, <laughs> in a new city, uh, and Santa Monica of all places, in a new environment with a, like all of a sudden these people that are in our lives, <laughs> we're like having to build relationships there. It was bizarre. Um, you know, we didn't really know him, and it was just it just was just bizarre. But anyways, I go to school. My PE teacher happened to be the varsity fast pitch coach. And she came up to me the first day I was in in school and she's like, well, welcome. Where are you from? Tell me a little bit about yourself. And I said, well, I'm from Washington. And I said, and I played fast pitch competitively for all these years. And she's like, oh, interesting. I'm the varsity fast pitch coach. Would you like to come practice with us? And I kid you not, I felt like that was a divine thing from God because it was the only thing that saved me, like from everything that was going on in my whole life at the time I left all my friends I had nobody except for my brother my mom and this new husband of hers and his parents and um you know I I, that was the saving grace and so I I ended up playing and 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 then long story short um we moved back up to Washington a year later because my stepdad had some issues with drug use it was not healthy my, I said, mom, we're leaving. You got to put him in rehab. Um, but I called dad and we're going back up to Washington. Wait, hold on. Time out. Hold yeah, on. I know. Oh, hold on, Jamie. <laughs> you made that decision. Yeah. 15 Where, years I, old. That's not, you know, I, I've shared this on the story before on the show before when I was, I was 15, I, I might've been 14, somewhere in that window. You know, I put a restraining order on my mom and my stepdad, and there's something about having to make those feel like insane decisions as a kid. Can, yeah, can like you almost have to, right? There, I, I always feel like there's this thing sitting inside of me where it's like, dude, if you don't make this decision right now, like, and you don't talk about this, you don't say this, you're gonna literally explode. Yeah. So, so you're. You're so perplexing to me because I like to me, I look at that and I go, how the fuck can a child actually do that? Right. Yeah. What was happening? I felt like I just had to grow up. As soon as things happened with my mom and dad, I was like the child. I was a sibling everyone looked to for strength and support. 
Mm. And so I just kind of grew up. I had to grow up. And I also was had the wherewithal. Like, even though I maybe didn't do, like, you know, but going back to that cigarette story, I did try one of his cigarettes. I'm like, this burns my lips. It doesn't taste good. Why does, why do people smoke? This is ridiculous. So I, I you know, like, you know, I tried to try and do, try to do things that people would do that would like, you know, be that, re- what I would call it a rebellious thing as a, as a kid. But I just realized that that was a waste of time and energy on my part. And that's not what I wanted to participate in. So I guess part of that is I just had to grow up. Like I just had to take responsibility for my life regardless of what was going on around me. And so when I recognized um, that these things that were happening inside my mom's marriage, new marriage, that were extremely unhealthy, I mean, I like, okay, they'll probably never watch this podcast or listen to it, but I remember getting in the car with my mom. Stepdad disappeared. At this point in time, I knew he was on drugs, and I'm talking heavy, like hardcore drugs, um, hallucinating, all that kind of stuff. Disappear for two days, uh, like at least a day. On day two, we, my mom goes, we got to go drive and find him. And the first place we went to was Venice Beach to try and see if he was somewhere on the streets in Venice Beach. Like, that's not normal 15-year-old activity happening in someone's life. Totally. So I was just like, after we found him, I said, Mom. On Venice like, Beach? No, we didn't find him. I don't even remember. I yeah. think he came home. I think he just came back to the house. I call. I remember calling my dad, and I didn't really let him in on what was going on out of preservation for my mom. Um, but... I just said, it's not good. We need, like, it's not good. And I think my mom was talking to one of her really good friends um, up there, and she came down to visit, and she saw it wasn't good. And so um, with that, she's like, we're, I, I said, you know, she kind of helped us go back, like, fly back to Washington. And I said, Mom, you need to put him in rehab, and you need to help him, and you need to get out of this relationship. Like, I just was like, you got to end this relationship. This is ridiculous. Well, he goes to rehab. Long- Long story short, he goes to rehab. She moves to Washington. He gets clean and sober. He moves to Washington. He enrolls at University of Washington, graduates with highest honors in like biochemistry or something like that, goes on to be a dentist and life life improves. Like it was just a dark period of time in his life. And she stood by him and I and and and, and forgave him. You know, like it's just crazy. But all that to be said, here they are 27 years later and they're they're doing quite well. Yeah, that's that's you know? wild. I mean, and adversity is everywhere. You know, I, everywhere. I think that people, I mean, you've been married for a long time. You have three children. People seem to think like when you find the one or a spouse or a partner or you get married, like it's all fucking rosy. And it's I've, like, <laughs> it's not, it's just not, you know, I even think about past relationships and, you know, being where I'm at in my life right now and just thinking about future relationships. And realizing, like, you know, sometimes you just got to fucking tough this shit out. Like, yeah. you got to have each other's back. You know, that's one of the things you and I, we we met. I don't know if we met at GrowthCon. I don't remember exactly where we met. But but I think about, like, Grant and Elena's relationship, right? As a couple who is mentors to both of us and billions of people around the world in various relationships. I think about Tom, Billy, and Lisa's relationship. I think about you know, so many of these amazing people. And it's like, man, it's the fucking winter's coming. Like it's gonna come, but yeah, guess what? It's kind of, I think about relationships so much about this adage that times make weak men, weak men make hard times, hard times make good men. And I think that's the same thing about relationships, right? I truly do more so now than ever, especially having a couple of, I won't call them bad relationships because I'd be unfair, but you know, any relationship that doesn't, and in a way that I think is in alignment and has collision of values, it's difficult, right? Wow. Yeah. And one of the things is you got to kind of come to this conclusion if you're willing to fight through the adversity and the difficulty. Mm-hmm. And so k- kudos to to them for being able to do that and for you and for all these people who have amazing relationships. But you know, going back, so now you're in this position, you're looking at your life and you, you take some interesting turns. And I know this after after high school, 
And I'd love for you to talk about this transition and what kind of starts to lead you down the path where more or less you are today. Hey, what's up, Unbroken Nation? We'll be right back to today's episode, but I want to take a moment and invite you to Think Unbroken Conference. That's right. Our next conference is happening right around the corner this December with amazing speakers from around the world who are leaders in personal development, trauma education, mindset, and more. All you have to do to register to watch for free, that's right, zero dollars, come and join us, is go to myunbrokenlife.com, register and sign up. You can get access to to the free event. Watch it live with us this December. It'll be myself speaking along with amazing human beings like Anthony Trucks, Jamie Bronstein, Leslie Logan, and a special interview that I'm doing with Dr. Gabor Mate that has never before been released. So come and join us, myunbrokenlife.com. All you have to do is put in your email. We'll send you over the registration. You'll be able to come and join us, watch live. And then if you want access to the recordings or more information there for you to keep them forever. But in the meantime, go sign up. Block it off on your calendar. This is going to be a transformational experience that you do not want to miss. Head over to myunbrokenlife.com to register for free. And until next time, be unbroken. Hey. Yeah. Well, um, so, you know, I graduate high school. I go off to college. I quit college because I'm like, I, this is not worth going to debt for because I didn't have a college fund. My parents, you know, going thinking back, and in hindsight, they both were just broken people who got married. Yeah. Totally. And they never, you know, I mean, you're, you think I'm broken. That's what your mission is all about is to heal, help people through the childhood trauma. My parents both had childhood trauma that they just never knew how to deal with. And then they were two broken people that got married and then really tried to make everything work. And, you know, so I... I also think that's where extending grace and forgiveness really does. Like my parents did the best they could with what they had. And then they just continued to go be, you know, be broken people getting married to other broken people. It's just, it's like it, 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 it perpetuate, like it's, it can, unless they go enough is enough. We're not doing this anymore. We're going to get the healing we need for our own lives. And, you know, I can't make them do that. I'm sure that they've had the healing in their, their life somewhere, but that's like all through high school, it was all about, okay, I got to shake this stuff off. I got to figure out who the hell I want to be. I go graduate from college or high school. I mean, my dad got married and eloped to Peter. <laughs> I don't know what it is with my parents eloping to these um, places. She was a psycho woman, had to deal with that and unwrap, uh, unpack and unwrap all of that stuff too. She she hated my guts. She's super jealous of me. And it's just bizarre. Like all these things. I'm like, what did I do? Like, what did I do to invite all this stuff to happen to me? But again, it was like, it felt like I had to just sh like shut all the stuff off and like figure out who I wanted to be. And so I, I talked about being like finding God in junior high and high school. I definitely found him like there. And I was like, okay, I am in a. I'm, I'm going to like at one moment in time in my life, I wanted to be like, um, an evangelist and, a, and, a, and teaching people how to live, um, the Christian life. Like that was one of the things. So I went to a church, I got involved with the ministry there and I met someone and I was like, oh, I felt a whole, I felt like, okay, I've done the work. I've done the healing stuff. I'm ready to get married. And, um, my whole goal in life was to have a marriage that was lasting and loving and an example um, of you can come from brokenness, but you can also have a, a, a thriving marriage like that. You know, I just wanted that. So I got married at 22 years old to a gentleman I met at church. We were married uh, about a year after we met and was dating. And then we got married six months later. So about a year and a half. Well, um, right after we got married, things just started falling apart out of my, like felt very much out of my control. And about a year into marriage, he had an affair. And I was like, the fuck is going on? Why is this adultery stuff? Like what's going on? Like, I just, I'd never met anyone that had had all these things happen. Like uninvited, like it just. Like, honestly, Michael, that was like, what the fuck? Like, yeah. 
I've had I've had a lot of what the fuck moments. Yeah. Really it's, and truly. And the the thing that I always come to, like having this language now, and I always remind myself of this as an adult, is life is happening for you and not to you, right? Thank God we have that. But man, as a kid, I'd be like, what the fuck? This is the the craziest shit would happen in my life. And I would just be like, this is a movie. This cannot be real. You can't One make it time, up. You can't make it up. One time, I'll never forget this. My mom is shit faced on mm -hmm. Thanksgiving. And this girl I had a huge crush on, like, actually comes to my house for the first time. And I'm like, oh my God, this is amazing. My mom walks out. Jamie, this is not fucking this is crazy shit. Walks out into the living room, wasted, butt naked. <laughs> and in that moment, like you having that thought, I was just like, are you fucking kidding me? Oh, oh, and I think so many, we don't invite it, right? That's the thing. And this is what I try to teach my clients all the time. It's like, you can be culpable for that shit. No. You can care that. And especially, you know, two things come to mind as like, one, I mean, good on you for trying to make that thing your reality. Mm -hmm. Marriage sands the chaos. But I believe this fully. The universe gives you what you're supposed to have. You can call that God. You can call that spirit. You can go yeah. out Mother Earth, whatever. And the hard part is, like, we don't want, Jamie, I don't want half of this shit. I know. And when it comes, I'm like, I don't want it. Take it away. Get yeah. This. But, but then I'm like. God, it just makes me grow. It yeah. makes me look at and reflect in the world. It makes me change in these really powerful and potent ways. And honestly, all the bad shit has only made my life better. Right. But that's not in harboring in it because I did that for a long time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you're you're 22. You're like, how the fuck is I'm getting invited to all of this? Probably because you got married at 22, but that's I just know. guy's opinion. Oh, my God. Um, <laughs> Anyone's watching and they're in their 20s. Don't even think about getting married till you're at least 30, maybe 35. Maybe 50. I mean, like. Yeah, you know. <laughs> no, but, you know, it was just one of those things that happened. And, and I remember being faced with the decision, what are you going to do? What is your decision going to be? And I feel like there's been this theme of things happening and it's hurtful. And I, of course, you know, I shed lots of tears and I had those pity party moments. But I even remember having pity party moments as a woman and just going, suck it up. Like, don't let this hold you down. Yes, cry for the minute that you need to, but then get up and keep going. Like, yeah. I just, I... I did not ever want to give in all that like power to the thing, circumstances that were happening, um, you know, to me and, or, you know, for me or well, I don't even know what that, yeah, yeah. I, but I was like, these are external circumstances and I am only responsible for how I respond to this and where I go from here. And I remember, I don't know, maybe it was like this in, in high school, I remember this motivational speaker came to the school. I was like, I want to be a motivational speaker someday because I want to help people get over their, you know, like their things that have happened in their lives. And, and I want, I want to teach women and young girls to like fall victim to crap or whatever it might be. And not to let that define or, or keep them like bo boxed in. I want them to be successful strong-willed, um, powerful, courageous, and confident women. And so that, like, and then I look back and it's like, God has a sense of humor because all of these things happened. And I felt like every time it was a test of how am I going to respond and grow from this circumstance. And, you know, the divorce thing happened. It was humiliating. Um, but at the same time, I rose up, I had my career at the Boeing company, which was, I felt like just a divine thing as well, traveled the world. And I was like, I am not even going to worry about relationships with, with men. I am going to focus on myself. I am going to take all this in this gift that I've been given of world travel through my company and, and just grow as a human and as a businesswoman. 
and um, lived the best life I could at that moment in time. And then it was, so I was like, this is awesome. And then I was like, okay, I'm ready for, I'm, I feel like I'm ready to share my life with someone. And in that time that I was traveling the world and being this successful businesswoman, world traveler, like it was awesome. I'm in my 20s without a college degree. <laughs> like I shouldn't have had that job, but I did. And I bought two houses along the way and was learning to cash flow uh, with real estate investing the wrong way. Like I thought I was pretty badass, to be honest. And then one of the houses when I was traveling, I, I had it under property management and it turned out to be a grow operation for about 900 marijuana plants in Washington. <laughs> and I only laugh because I'm like, like are you kidding and it was to completely destroyed. The police busted down the door. Like, they didn't bust the door open. They actually opened it. I didn't find out until six months later. It was completely destroyed. My my savings was all, de you know, depleted for making the mortgage payment while we we're trying to rent it out. The property management company. Um, that's another story. But just you know, had to file bankruptcy and then recover from that. And so. This is happening in my mid twenties or you, late twenties. You know what's interesting? I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause you real quick because it's a lot, right? And I'm that's looking a lot, at your yeah. Life. It is a lot, and I just go, man, it's like every we face challenges nonstop. Yes, it's going to stop. It's not. Like it's never going to end. Never. And there was something about the resiliency that you have to be willing to tap in that is going to be the differentiating factor between success and failure in your life, right? And and I think you and I would both agree with this. You know, victimhood is a part of this. Take take your time, recover, but yep. don't get trapped in it. Right. right. Don't get fucking trapped. Because that was me. 20 yep. to 26, I was trapped in it. I mean, how do you make a million dollars and be 40 grand in debt, 350 pounds, smoking two packs of drinking yourself to sleep? Like I was playing the victim. And it's like... Mm -hmm. You know, at some point you're going to have to pick yourself up. And I know that's like fucking tough love for yourself. And a lot of people hate hearing that. And the people who listen to this show, I know that they don't because that's why they listen because we keep it real, but nobody's coming. No one's coming. Nobody coming to save your ass. No you one. File no bankruptcy. You got to get a divorce. You deal with infidelity. You fucking get fired from a job. You break your leg. You have a surgery. You get sick. Ain't nobody coming. Right. You've got to be willing to sit in it and look at it and go, yep, this fucking sucks. Yeah. Now what do I do? The, yeah. the question that changed my life forever, and you kind of pointed to it, is I asked myself, what are you willing to do to have the life that you want to have? Yes. And I swear, I swear to everything I love that if you don't ask yourself that question, nothing's going to be different. Yep. And, you know, I think people also look at, bankruptcy is like the scarlet letter but it's really what's crazy jb and you know and people look at a lot of different things and they go that's a scarlet letter how dare you yeah but i was sitting dinner one time um with two billionaires two i'm not a billionaire I not don't, yet i don't know that i ever will be it doesn't matter the mission is the yeah. mission and i'm sitting here having this conversation with this guy and he goes uh he goes, yeah, man, I had to file bankruptcy two times. And I was like, what? And he goes, the first time it was like, you know, not a big deal, 400,000 bucks. The second time he goes, it was $38 million. Oh, well, I would have definitely won the $38 million bankruptcy over the 400,000. Oh, 100%, 100%. <laughs> but the thing that people don't understand, and and I, my hope is that a lot of people will step into their side hustles and step yeah. in entrepreneurship and find freedom and take themselves out of the corporate lies. Another conversation for another day. Another but, one, yes. But, but I want to plant a seed. Bankruptcy to an extent, and I'm not a lawyer, not a bankruptcy lawyer. Do not take this as legal advice. Don't fucking sue me because I don't know what I'm talking about. But bankruptcy to an extent is like a fucking get out of jail free card for entrepreneurs. Yeah. And no I mean, other it was place in pure... the world can you do that? It was purely because of the real estate. It wasn't my own personal. I was, you know, $100,000 in personal debt with consumer credit cards. It was, yeah. uh, you know, real estate investing gone wrong because of the wrong tenants, you know. Uh, how, what about lack of education? Is it only the oh. tenants? 
Well, I, but so my, my only thing that I can say was I hired a property management company to manage the property. Yeah. So, cause I was traveling all over the world. So I, you know, I wasn't gonna, um, they found the tenants, they took care of the house, they collected the rent. I got, you know, Kick. the money and, and, and everything. So part of me, the reason why I filed bankruptcy was from a lawyer who I went to to say, can we sue the property management company? And he's like, no one's going to touch this case. You might as well just file bankruptcy and walk away. Yeah. I was like, oh, and, what? I can and, do that? Like, And you can do that. I can do that? But and, you know what's fascinating is people carry so much shame and guilt about all of these things, right? Yeah. And so what? this is a transition for you because, and I want to rewind, you're traveling, this thing happens, but life is also kind of really good. Right. But Great. Yeah. And you're, and you're kind of like, I think I'm ready. Yes. And, and then what happens? Um, so then I met my husband, my now husband, we met through eHarmony before it was ever cool to do the online dating. And I don't even know if it's still cool. Like eHarmony is still not cool. Let's call it what it is. Okay. So, but I mean, I tried the match.com. I tried the millionaires, like singles thing. And in fact, I met somebody who was like, a founder of a really big time company, but he was a liar. Like, and I just, I'm like, I can't, I don't need lying. I even one lie. I don't need a lie. I don't need lying. I just yeah. don't, I, I've had enough of it in my life. I just have had enough shit happen in my life that if someone's going to, I don't want to build a relationship based off a of distrust or a single lie. Like, I don't care how wealthy you are. I don't, that's not what I wanted. Um, so I, I met my husband on eHarmony. We, we, we met. We had like instant chemistry. We ended up dating long distance for a year. And I moved to California. Um, and he, he like thought he was like, wow, this amazing girl. She's a businesswoman. She's got two houses. She is doing really well for herself. Like sitting pretty cold. Like, you know kind of thinking that and then all of a sudden all this stuff of bankruptcy happens and this and that happens he's like and I'm like I hope he doesn't break up with me just because these things happen that were beyond my control and thankfully he didn't he was very gracious but um we ended up dating we got married and so that's how I ended up back in California and we've been married we're coming up on 12 years of marriage and three kids later and you know life is like I, we worked hard to create the life that we want. We've, we worked through things like I'll never forget the first, like we used to go to all these conferences together and the breakthrough conference for me was this one called like the millionaire mind intensive. And I remember going to this and having utter like the most cleansing cry and breakthrough and had everything to do with the financial, like my financial, because I remember I started working at 16. My parents didn't like, I never got new clothing, maybe a pair, new pair of jeans and a new jacket and a new pair of shoes. And that was it. Everything else I had to buy for myself. I'll never forget buying the very first boom box for a hundred dollars. I worked so hard to earn that. And I'm like, is it worth me trading all that time that I worked at Pizza Hut serving pizza to people to go and buy this? I mean, I just got wrapped up in value and exchange of time and money and all that um i definitely felt i had financial like chains weighing me down but this this that millionaire mind intensive freed me up and it changed my life and you know love or hate robert kiyosaki but his that book rich dad poor dad changed my life that's wild yeah and and i sit and i hear this and i'm like you know you're actually living that dream that as a 20 something you thought you were gonna get Right. And that's powerful. It's amazing because I think so many people, God, it's just like, if, if there's one thing that I hope people take from this conversation is like, you're, you're going to get thrown to the ground yeah, again and again and again, but you can still have what you want. Yeah. Like you can't, you just can't uh, again, just to reference Grant, because I love this quote. It's probably my favorite quote that he's ever said, you know, you, you look at, the world and it's like as long as you don't quit you never lose yeah 
And I, I sit with that all the time because here you are, very different life. Now, I know you from the business world. People know you as Jamie Green, the solar queen. People will know you as whatever it is you choose to be next. But it's like your dreams, all the aspirations, all the goals, all the things that you want, not even you particularly, Jamie, but anyone listening to this right now, it's like you can have them. You yeah. just have to not quit on yourself. Yeah, you got to keep, got to get up and keep going. And you have to live life with intention, with goals. I mean, goals that scare you, but also goals that you know you can accomplish along the way to get to where you want to go. And I think that was what was so, what's so incredible about my husband. His name is Matt. Uh, one, some of the things that really attracted me to him was the fact that he, you know, uh, he's a, he, he will say this, he will not admit this, but he, I mean, he will, but he's a, like a five-time Ironman triathlon. He's ran over 50 marathons. So to me, it showed me that he is committed. He's dedicated and he knows what it takes. Like he, when he started running and doing marathons and all that stuff, he was, a, he, you know, he had, um, a relationship with alcohol that he had to sever and when he did he had to find something new to be passionate and um focused on and that became running he went from i think he was way overweight i didn't know him at the time but he was way he was on his journey of of letting go of the this you know crap from his life that he had sat in for a while he was ready to make himself new and so by the time i met him and um and, and vice versa, when we met each other, had we met each other 10 years prior, we would have never met. We would have never made it. We, this and that. So so there were things about his character that I admired and the things that he, the activities he was involved in that made me, that told me without me having to ask him or, or for him to boast about. But there were character traits about him that was very desirable and, and, and you know, um, honorable in that he knew what commitment looked like he knew what it meant to to keep going even though he wanted he his body probably wanted to quit he kept going so you know we when we got married we we did we every anniversary we set goals for our marriage set goals for our financial future set goals for our personal you know um great and brand talk about personal professional and financial goals as a business but also as a human being and it was it just was so wonderful to meet him and and go okay let's let's do this thing called life and marriage and go after it when we when i moved to california it was right after the 2008 2009 financial crisis and i didn't know anybody in san francisco no one was hiring and so that's where the hustle inside of me was born you know, I left my very secure job to marry him. And it was, I have to figure this out. I have to figure it out. I have to go out and fa find a way to make money. I started a photography business. I started dog running just to, for immediate cash, like dog running. I made $30 an hour dog running, not walking, running, <laughs> okay. you know? So um, and out of that, an e-commerce, uh, doing e-commerce on Amazon, like just all these things, learning to trade the financial market and just going, ah, I just felt like these were not the things that I need, I, that I was passionate about. And then I got into digital marketing and that's when solar found me. And it's just been one of these things that I was a gift and I took it. And now I'm in this industry that hasn't even really taken off yet. But I would say that it all, all these things, you know, like you, you and I were talking before the show about super hyper focusing on the thing, like the one thing, what's the thing that's going to get you to the next thing and not be, not be distracted by shiny object syndrome, which so many entrepreneurs are, but just to stay focused on the goal and the prize that you want and desire in life. And I do feel very grateful and blessed that I have a husband that supports me in all these things, but also we do have common vision of where we want to go uh, individually and as a married couple. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. And you do have to have that. You have to, you cannot have a conflict of values. You cannot, it does not no. work. You will be half no. yoked all day long. And that's probably the greatest lesson that I've learned um, through relationships is like, if you are not on the same page, you are screwed, period. 
You yeah. just are. And, yeah. and, you know, and I, I think that a lot of people, you know, they, they look at growth, they look at potential and they're scared of it. And for a long time, I was too. I was like, I'm terrified to be successful. Like I, I've only ever known you're not good enough. You're never going to have the things that you want. Nobody's going to care. And now I look at my life and it's like, I've spoken on some of the biggest stages in the world. Luckily, this podcast is changing people's lives every day. We got the Think Unbroken Academy community where we got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, almost thousands of people in this group who are getting support. And it's like, just focus, just yeah, focus and do the thing. But, but in that also invest in yourself, be right. willing to bet on you. And that's what you did. You bet on you, you bet on you and your husband to leave an incredible job, to go into the unknown, to run dogs, which is absolutely insane. And then to be willing to be like, you know what? Sometimes you have to spend money to yes. be a better version of you, to be a different version of you. And and there's a lot of people who, you know, their shoes cost more money than they've invested in themselves in their whole life. And I have a hard time paying more than $50 for a pair of shoes, Michael. Yeah. No, I have no problem paying $5,000 or $10,000 for self-development. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, I definitely have a couple of nice pair of shoes, but like ultimately, you know, you look at it and you go, priorities are everything. Goals are everything. Picking yourself back up, recognizing like, man, that, that next punch to the gut, it's right around the corner. Yeah. But yes. just saying, you know what? I accept that reality and I'm willing to bet on me. Right. Jamie, th this conversation has been awesome. I know we could go much, much longer. Um, but before I ask you my last question, please tell everyone where they can find you. Uh, I'm on all the social medias except for, well, I, I'd say Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, and YouTube, um, Jamie Green. Jamie Green, the Solar Queen. Um, YouTube is youtube.com forward slash Jamie Green. And that's all my YouTube channel is all about solar energy. You should be wearing a crown when we do interviews. I know. So I know. Now, for you, the, we'll talk about this off air, but we need to get you a crown. My last question for you, my friend, what does it mean to you to be unbroken? Oh my gosh. It means to run freely into the thing that you want and not to let the circumstance hold you back um you know you said sit in sit in the the sorrow of it for a little while sit in that but just keep going um because it's kind of like breaking in a horse you know you have to break that horse to be able to make it be amazing and fast and do the thing and i feel like that like i don't want to be I don't want to be held back by circumstance or, or things. I want to be able to freely go and go as swiftly as I need to and want to go and without anything encumbering me or holding me back and tying me down. So that's what I think it means to be unbroken. Yeah, with unbroken. I love that. And thank you so much for being here, my friend. Unbroken Nation, thank you so much for listening. Please like, subscribe, comment, tell a friend, join the Think Unbroken Academy at thinkunbrokenacademy.com. And until next time, my friends, be unbroken. I'll see you. Hey, Unbroken Nation, we'll be right back to the show, but I wanted to let you know that you can grab a copy of my first book, Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma, for free. If you go to book.thinkunbroken.com, you can download the PDF ebook version of the book and get everything that I know about the baseline of healing trauma for free downloaded to your email right now. Just go to book.thinkunbroken.com to download your copy of Think Unbroken, Understanding and Overcoming Childhood Trauma for a PDF for your phone. Again, that is book.thinkunbroken.com. Thank you so much for listening to Think Unbroken. Please share this episode with someone who could use it and help us move forward in our mission of ending generational trauma in our lifetime. And if you would, please take five seconds to pop on iTunes or Spotify, hit that five star, leave a review. And you can also reach out to us on social at Michael Unbroken or at Think Unbroken. And of course, you can check out our YouTube channel at Think Unbroken. Thank you for being a part of Unbroken Nation, my friends. And until next time, be unbroken. Hey, my friends, we will be right back to the show. But I have a question for you. 
Are you struggling with the impact of childhood trauma? Well, know that you're not alone. I'm here to let you know that I'm starting a brand new weekly coaching group that includes a year of life coaching, accountability, support, habit and goal setting, and more. I'm starting a wait list for the group right now, and I'm only taking a handful of people. And I'll let you know that through this personalized coaching, we'll work together to help you understand how your childhood trauma has shaped your beliefs, behaviors, emotions, and will help you create a roadmap for healing and growth. Right now, you can schedule an absolutely free coaching session with me and get put on the wait list if you go to thinkunbroken.com. My friends, it's your time to turn your trauma into triumph, breakdowns into breakthroughs, and become the hero of your own story. And I'm here to support you in doing that. Just go to thinkunbroken.com to register for a free coaching call with me and to get put on the wait list for the brand new weekly coaching program.